today we have a very special guest, one of my good friends, a family friend. She's like my sister, and she has come here today to、uh, provide some insight into the field of therapy. So today we'd like to give a big welcome to Shawnee Johnson. Hi. How how are you doing? I'm well.、Uh, <laughs> relatively, work is busy, and you know the climate that we're in. <laughs> But、mm. you know, I'm happy、yeah. taking care of myself. That's、yeah. all anyone can do. Right, right, agreed. Where are you at right now? So this year, I was I'm like really focusing on self care, wherever that entails. Basically, anything that makes me that helps me to like feel good. And、oh, so、okay. um, I had a busy day, so I actually went to the gym. I have some、um, gym buddies, and so we worked out. And I'm just getting home from that. That's、mm-hmm. awesome. What What other stuff do you do for like self care? Um, it's still a learning process for me. Just like thing, I'm learning that is just things for myself. So if that's going to the gym, you know, that's something for me. That's for my health. That's for my well being. If it's journaling. Um, it can even be down to like boundaries. If I, you know, had a long week and friends want to hang out, but I really need to stay in a recharge. Recharge. That's self care for me as well because I'm, I'm taking time for myself, not you know, exhausting my time or exhausting myself for others. I'm just focusing on me. So it can encompass anything and everything. And Do you everything. feel like that your like line of work is teaching you this kind of stuff? I think yes, and and my line of work, you, it's really important that you don't exhaust yourself. You know, I work in social services. There is something called empathy fatigue, where you just really get burnt out, and you're not effective when you're working with you know with with people. And so, I think my line of work it will force you to practice self care because if not, you're really going to struggle within your profession. Were you always self aware of like self care? Or was it the 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 schooling and therapy that taught you that? I think it's a combination of everything.、Mm. I think there was ways that I thought I was taking care of myself, but not really. And just learning what self care means for me,、um, and so that is still a learning process. But I, I definitely think like schooling, because you know, and and my profession, because we we teach our clients to, or we try to encourage our clients to practice self care.、Mm-hmm. I'm you know I'm, I'm being forced to kind of you know not only talk but walk the walk. Um, our listeners don't know exactly what it is that you do. Do you want to tell tell them、um, a little bit about what you're doing for work? So full time, I am a social worker, and I work with、um, elderly and dependent adults. I do investigations、uh, for abuse cases. So if abuse could be financial abuse, physical,、uh, mental suffering. That's like you know verbal abuse, neglect, which you know that happens a lot with the population. Sexual abuse, but that would be under physical. And then I'm also interning. So I recently graduated. I am studying to become a marriage, a licensed marriage and family therapist. So I intern part time at a crisis center,、um, and there it's just you know it's、uh, crisis center therapy.、Uh, we deal with、um, acute psychology. So、um, I've at the crisis center, I've experienced people who who are diagnosed with very severe psychosis. Personality disorders, trauma, and、uh, substance abuse disorder. Oh, that's amazing, man! You have a full plate. You are busy, girl. I am, but I—I I mean, at the crisis center, so I, I work per diem.、Um, that was that was part of my self care, just because I realized I was getting burnt out at the crisis center. And it, there's a lot that goes to that, and maybe we'll probably touch on that a little later. But、mm. the nature of the job can be draining. Mm-hmm. So I do that part time, you know, because I I I wanted to be effective, and I knew that you know,、um, if I just felt too stressed out, and I had a difficult client, which you know, if you're working with someone who is diagnosed with a personality disorder, they can be a difficult client.、Mm-hmm. I wanted to be effective, and I wanted to serve them correctly. And if I was burnt out, I wouldn't have been able to do my job.、Mm-hmm. So I lowered my hours down to per diem, and I'm very conscious of when I pick up hours there. 
Uh, mm-hmm. The good thing about working for my full-time job is that they actually provide the license hours. So it's going to be like a one-stop shop, right. Right. Um, which is really helpful for anyone in the field because you don't want to, like I said, exhaust your time and exhaust yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people in the field of social services, they find themselves having to work multiple jobs because maybe they have a full-time job here because that pays the bills. Mm-hmm. But they, they still need to get their hours, you know, for their license or to be able to take the license test. So they're working, you know, another job and they can't work at that other job full time because, it, you know, the pay is not, mm-hmm. you know, where it needs to be for them to be able to manage. Right. Mm-hmm. I've been fortunate to find a place where I can work full time, support right. myself financially, independently, but also may, uh, work towards my the goal of my career. Must be a lot, though. I mean, not only like in terms of the hours, but also in terms of like mentally, emotionally, you know, what it must be doing to you as a person as well as like, it's a lot. Um, typically in um, at a time, how many cases would you take? So for the for my full time job, so with the doll protective services, caseload wise, the cases can be high. Um, this week was a slow week, but. I can get six cases within a week. Um, and so I'll like the way that that position works. Um, so you get a case, you open it, you read through it. Um, you have about, you have 10 days to activate the case. So that means if you were assigned someone and it was deemed that you actually need to lay eyes on them, we call that face to face. You have 10 days to do that um, and meet with the client. And then you start the case management. It's Mm -hmm. a quick turnaround. So we try to close the cases within 25 days. Some clients, you need to have it open just because the needs are greater. And you want, our goal is to always, our goal is to try to resolve the protective issue as much as possible. So with with adults, it's different because adults, um, they have capacity to make their own choices. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if I receive a case and it's a self-neglect case, which is, you know, considered abuse, abuse to, you know, the person's oneself. And I go to their house and the self-neglect issue is that they're hoarding and they've made their living environment, you know, their living environment's unsanitary. It's not hygienic, Mm -hmm. but they're choosing to stay in that environment. You know, it's self-determination. This is their choice. They have the capacity to make it. And I have Mm -hmm. to just create, make it as safe as possible for them. Uh, yeah. to live there you know everyone's mm. entitled to their their choice whether mm. we agree with it or not how would you typically though like get informed of a case like this like a self-neglect would it be that person themselves calling you and saying that they think they have an issue or is it like neighbors how, how would it even come to you so a person can refer themselves or anyone in the community can make a can make the reports so it could be a doctor maybe they have a client that came in and the client looked disheveled, the client is, um, they ju- or they uh, just diagnosed the client with dementia. Mm-hmm. And they, they're, they're seeing that they're disheveled. They don't, they don't really know if they have any natural support. So that would be like family or friends. Um, and they're driving. So, you know, a doctor may decide, okay, this is definitely APS case. Banks make a lot of them. So the client, you know, uh, he, like there's been this, um, a lot of elderly clients have been falling victims to like the online and email scams. Right. Oh yeah. So if a, you know, I see that a lot of a client, you know, had thousands taken from them because of this, you know, they clicked on a link because they thought they had a virus and this link promised to connect them with the representative that's mm-hmm. going to help them. And then they, you know, that person takes them for their money. Um, and they go to the bank and they, you know, report what happened. The bank will create, you know, an APS report for that client as well. Neighbors can do it. I've had neighbors call on someone because they were outside and responding to internal stimuli, you know, meaning they're responding to like maybe voices or, Mm -hmm. you know, they're talking to themselves and Mm -hmm. things just didn't seem right. Or I've had calls because someone overheard a son screaming at his elderly mother. Mm -hmm. So cases come in for a multitude of reasons. Have you ever dealt with uh, anything where you've had to sort of confront a system like a corporation this is reminding me of what was that movie there's yeah that came out i think you really like care a, or something like yeah. that yeah care a lot yes care a lot. that's the one yeah so let's say this is there's a client and they live in like an assisted living facility and yeah. they have a complaint or the family has a complaint against 
the caregiver at the facility. So that would be, that's a, still a section of adult protective services, but that when I like an, an APS worker wouldn't go in, that was more of unbudsman. Mm-hmm. So anything with facilities, like large facilities, hospitals, um, they actually have, um, there's an organization that takes care of abuse cases. So for me personally, I've never had to deal with an organization um, mm-hmm. per se. I have like a unique case right now that I'm working on where it seems like, uh, this client's caregiving agency dropped the ball. Um, and so I want to call them and ask questions. Mm. But for the most part, I'm not dealing with those larger agencies. Right. Um, but there is a section of APS that, you know, deal, deals with that. And that's within their jurisdiction to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm. I'm mostly dealing with individuals. So I'll have suspected abusers, most likely their family, mm. or maybe they're like a, like a, a private caregiver. Right. So those are, you know, if I have to question anyone, yeah. it would be like those kinds of people. For our listeners who don't know, can you define what that acronym means, APS? So adult protective services. That's, so I, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people understand what CPS is. Mm. Protective yeah. Services, right, yeah. right. And that one's more common. Yeah. But for at least I know like here in California, like we do have for elderly adults, because that's a, you know, that's a population that's in need. Mm and dependent adults it's you know definitely a population they're vulnerable right right so the only the difference is though is adults have capacity to make decisions Mm -hmm. and everyone is entitled to a decision to whether we view that decision as correct or Mm -hmm. incorrect everyone's entitled to their decision Mm -hmm. and um adults can practice their capacity to make decisions so Mm -hmm. their their decisions so like if i have a client who is living with a an abusive son who's like screaming at her and and taking her money and and stealing things from her and she chooses to continue living with that person and she has the capacity to make that decision that's Mm -hmm. that's within her right so with child protective services um i know that a lot of like social workers goals or aims are to reintegrate the child back into the family so what is the view on reintegration for adult protective services well with with adult protective services are like we really want to empower the client and i think you know that definitely comes in with this person centered we it's not our goals it's their goals Mm -hmm. and we want to empower them to the best of their ability to um you know make decisions that are gonna be for their benefit Mm -hmm. um so for example you know if i if i have a client and you know, they live with uh, their son or their daughter, their adult child, and their adult child is the main caretaker for them. You know, like, would it be a benefit to really, if this client is depending on the adult child to Mm -hmm. um, go to the grocery store, you know, manage the finances, Mm -hmm. you know, put the roof over their head. It's, it's, and, and there's a, I guess the report came that the the child, the adult child is yelling at the the client. It would, it would probably hurt the client for me to remove them from the home or Mm -hmm. to remove the, that, that adult child from the home Mm -hmm. because then I'm leaving the client without any resources. So we really try to, and I guess that's where we do some family stuff, really try to help them within that situation. So, you know, in like I would talk to that child or, you know, that adult child and ask, like, you know, what, what's going on? Like, you know, someone, you know, overheard you screaming. And, you know, I've had this happen before where they're like, well, I'm frustrated because they're not listening, you know, mm-hmm. and it turns out, you know, the, the client just had dementia. And so they're acting out. And so Mm. that person, that adult child just really needed support. Is he, was he being abusive? No, but was he losing his temper and probably saying inappropriate things? Yes. Mm. Um, So you don't want to rush in gung ho and, you know, we got to remove the client or we're going to, we're going to evict, you know, Mm. or do a restraining order against this, um, and I guess against our kid or his kid, you know, we really want to empower them within their home. We don't want to remove anyone from the home. Mm. You are dealing with some heavy stuff. <laughs> it seems so like <laughs> mentally straining. That's where the self-care piece comes in. Right. And, and that's where also the whole self-determination piece comes in because you can easily find yourself. And this is like, and when I was going to school and first starting to intern, this is something that was, you know, expressed on the daily. It mm. was, you cannot work harder for your clients you you have to meet them where they're at Mm. because you will get burnt out you'll get frustrated Mm. i've had clients who 
I, one person in particular, I, I remember her case it, it, it was, it, it was frustrating. You know, she, um, she had substance use. She was an older woman. She had substance use disorder, um, but she was also a hoarder and, and, and her house was, you know, it, it was not hygienic at all. There was bugs and molded food and it was malodorous. We had so many resources for her. She was in the perfect position, her insurance, everything for us to be able to help her. There was like at the time where, when I kept getting her case, there was like uh, some funding uh, for case management programs that she qualified for. Mm -hmm. So there was so much that we could have done for her and she just refused. And so she kept getting referrals into the APS system because she just kept falling. She kept ending up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. She would leave the hospital, hospital AMA. That means against medical advice. Mm -hmm. Um, So like if they were trying to treat her for like a UTI so that it doesn't become septic, Mm -hmm. she would just leave. She wouldn't have her medicine. And there was just really nothing I can do for her. And it was getting frustrating because mm-hmm. I kept having her case come into my queue every week. And I was like, well, this woman doesn't want anything. Right. Mm-hmm. And I and I had to take a step back and really look at what she's going through, you know, mm-hmm. and she's a substance, you know, she has substance abuse, but I'm sure there's depression. And so I just tried to meet her where, where she was at. And I, you know, I let her know that I validated her. I said, listen, this is your home and, and you're an adult and, and, and it's your decision. Mm. And when you're ready, the support will be there for you. Just you let us know. Mm. Right. Instead of taking the approach of, oh, I'm tired of this lady. I'm not even yeah. going to go try mm. to see her again because she doesn't want any help. No, mm. it just, it maybe she does want help, but she's just not, she's not where I feel she should be, but it's mm. not my life. Mm. Hers. Right. Did, did she finally come around? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh. I'm sure when you do your self care, it it allows you to reorient yourself so you could come back and like, you know, tolerate that type of stuff. But it's, Mm -hmm. it seems like it's tough. I want to get back to the the topic of empathy fatigue. Uh, How do you know when you, for you personally, when you are burnt out? I know when I'm burnt out when I'm, because I'm a very patient person Mm -hmm. and when I am easily frustrated, trying to think back of on examples, (laughs) of when I was experiencing the empathy fatigue to back up a little bit, the crisis center. So people have to be in crisis. Mm. They're either endorsing SI, which is like suicidal ideation, Mm. um, meaning they want to kill or kill themselves or harm themselves in some way or HI homicidal ideation. They want to kill or harm others. Mm. Um, And so a lot of times we get clients referred from the hospital, you know, they, they went to the hospital on a 5150 because they want it or, attempted to end their life what, what's a 5150 so this is like when you're held against i guess against your will yeah. mm-hmm. okay. um and so you can do that for people who are uh you know who don't have the capacity or demonstrating lack of capacity or when they're either threatening to kill themselves or kill others so we get a lot of those clients who are experiencing crisis and they go to the crisis center very short term. Like the, the longest they can be there is really 21 days, but more commonly they're out by two weeks. It's very short term therapy, very short term case management. We're really just trying to connect them with services. We stabilize them at the crisis center, but try to connect them with services so that they can continue their therapy when they mm-hmm. leave with the crisis center, with social services. Sometimes you get a lot of clients just thrown at you and, it was weeks of just having clients like thrown at me. Like my caseload was were high was high for the day. Like you know, seeing eight clients in an eight hour period, having to do the notes, um, having to you know do the case management for them, dealing with the behaviors and all the other responsibilities that you have to do in the crisis house. It's it's just a lot in a day. Yeah. Um, so it's just that was happening for some time, and that's because you know we were short staff. You know, there's like, there's high turnaround sometimes in, in, in these facilities. Mm. Um, and I had a client and she had a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. So this was one of the days where she was just not cooperating with anyone. Mm. She um, was rude and she would posture at staff, meaning, you know, try to intimidate us like with, with her movements. Mm. Um just very verbally aggressive and inappropriate. And for the most part, I, I have, I, I have patience to deal with those behaviors and I can, you know, redirect and, and mm-hmm. calm them down. Um, but there was a, there was a point in time where I just had a few clients who just all had the same disorder and just very aggressive with me. And one of my clients 
she came into the therapy room was her time for a session and she was just not cool. Like she just was not, she didn't want to say anything. She said, I'm just going to sit here in silence and we don't need to do therapy. And so I didn't really encourage her. I was just like, you know what, if you refuse, you refuse and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, I refuse. And so I let her go. And I, and I noticed, I was like, I must be burnt out because old Shawnee would have, I would have like started to do therapy with her. Maybe like I would have, you know, started a conversation about something else Mm. and then maybe go back to the Mm. topic at hand. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just didn't really try with her. And I realized that I was getting burnt out at that point. So Mm. I took some days off. Um, Mm. I was able to work with that client later on, Mm -hmm. but I I just took some days off because I, I realized that I was, I was just over it. And if I was over it, I wasn't going to be, effective to anyone i wasn't going sure. to encourage anyone i was yeah. i was you know getting frustrated with them mm-hmm. and you know you have to really check when you're starting to have those emotions mm-hmm. where the job becomes overwhelming because it can be um you really have to like mm-hmm. kind of check out if mm-hmm. you have the opportunity some people don't so mm-hmm. I, I always recognize that mm-hmm. i had the opportunity to check out so i was very fortunate because i had a full-time job so yeah. i was able to just say hey i'm not going to take on some shifts i'm gonna take a little break that's awesome. That's awesome that you're aware of that. Mm. Cause I feel like not even just in the field of like therapy, but like people get burnt out and they don't realize they are doing, you know, they're not performing at their highest level. Mm. Sometimes mm. I don't have the opportunity. Like right. I had to, so exactly. me working at the crisis center, that was like supplemental income. Yeah. I, I could afford to just take some days off from there because that wasn't my main income, Mm -hmm. but there were people who were there and I could tell they were burnt out because they would say like, I hate coming here. You know, Mm -hmm. that's a clear sign of you're burnt out with this place. Mm -hmm. Um, That was their main job. That was their only job. And and they needed that job to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, social services is not known for, you know, paying people very Mm -hmm. high salaries. Yeah, it's like you kind of always have to remind yourself, like the reason for why you're doing something like this, like the bigger picture um, in order to sort of like stick around because it's so easy to like lose sight of, you know, why you got into it in the first place. That leads me to my next question. What inspired you to do this, to get into this field altogether? I'm I'm a people person. I'm an introvert, but I've, I'm, I've always been drawn to the helping professions and originally it was nursing and then I branched off from nursing and um I started studying psychology and just really really liked like what I was reading really liked what I was studying and wanted to make a career of it I will say I didn't thoroughly you know I was was young so I didn't really thoroughly do my research at the time Mm -hmm. when before I got into the position or before I I really started to study it Mm -hmm. You know, I think like there was there was a point in time where I really thought that I could come out studying psychology, get my four year degree, get my bachelor's in it and and would have a job. And that is not the case. Like you may be able to work, you know, using those skills, but there you you don't really do therapy at that point. And so I knew that I was going to have to go back to school and further my education if I really wanted to have a a career Mm -hmm. and make a career out of it. Yeah. And so that's what I did. So junior year, I said, you know, I'm going to stick with it. I'm not going to change majors mm-hmm. and I'm, you know, I'm just going to make a career out of this. And so I did a lot of resume building mm-hmm. when I decided to really make a career out of psychology. Um, I started working as like a caregiver for, um, for group homes um, because they, they did a lot of ABA therapy. I started working as a behavioral therapist. That was a resume builder. And then I started managing group homes, uh, did that for years, had that experience. And so when, you know, when I did get into my grad program and it was time for me to intern and I wanted to go to uh, the crisis center, I had like a lot of background stuff that would, mm-hmm. that would have helped that helps me to uh, get into the crisis center. Mm-hmm. And then from there was able to get uh, a position at my job. And I've only been at my new job with APS for about six months. So I'm, I'm really new. Yeah. Oh. So it was more of me just trying to find those opportunities to really make my resume look impressive um, so that I can get into an organization that I can then build my career in. Mm -hmm. And the county, it's, you know, it's, there's long-term stuff happening there. You can, there's growth there. So Mm -hmm. even if I don't stay in adult protective services, once I'm licensed, which is the goal, you know, I can work as a therapist Mm -hmm. within the county. Um, 
which is what I want to do. So mm-hmm. that's how I got into the field. Was there ever um, a moment where you were like, you know what, screw therapy. I do not want to do this anymore. I mean, you said that with nursing, right? And then you went to therapy because you are a people person. But was there ever a moment where you were like, you know what, I, I can't do this? Yeah. And I was actually just about to touch on that. It was, I was working managing group homes which is your own call for 24 hours um just a very busy job supervising you know staff like managing you know residents dealing with families and all these outside providers so i did that i was doing that i was taking night classes um at national like finishing my uh my program and then i was also interning so i I just every day was allotted to something that wasn't like, I guess it was for me in terms of my future, Mm -hmm. but I didn't really feel it. It was just Mm -hmm. like exhausting. Like I I get out of work, you know, and then I would have school from five to 10. And then while I'm in class, you know, I'm still getting calls from work because I, just because I was physically off doesn't mean I'm off because you're 24 hours on call. Mm -hmm. And then weekends, I didn't really have time to really, you know, um, take care of myself because I had to study on the weekends Mm. and I had my internship to work on the weekends and I would just be so drained when I came home. Mm. And, you know, I, I was dealing with very acute disorders, you know, I'm dealing with someone who has substance use disorder, but they're also homeless, you know, Mm. um, or, and they, and they don't have any support. So they, they really, you know, really lean on you. And it just mm-hmm. got to the point, and it like it, I think like last year even I was just I was like I'm I'm gonna go back to school I'm I'm gonna do like occupational therapy or mm-hmm. I'm gonna do something else or I'll go and get my LVN I'll finish my nursing program mm-hmm. because I don't know if psychology is for me mm-hmm. um, and I really was regretting it and I think lately I've been like okay I, I felt I felt I feel a little more confident in my career choice just because I I'm, I'm working in a position where I have that work life balance mm-hmm. and that really wasn't there before. So do you think that work life balance is what like reignited your, you know, your drive? Yeah, because I was I'm able to I've never in, in in 5 years I've never even long before that I've never had weekends off, right? Man. And now I can choose to work if I want to work mm. on weekends I choose that, you know, if I want to pick up hours at the internship um at the crisis center, but no, I wasn't taking care of myself and you know, imagine coming home from a long day of dealing with people, difficult, you know, sometimes, you know, you're dealing with difficult people, not necessarily your clients, but the people that you have to work with to provide care can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, doing that and, you know, not really having a chance to take a breath or not really like, you're not really in the mindset. If you're so stressed, you're not in the mindset to, to see what the benefit is. It's really hard for you to do that. Um, that long-term thinking because you're, it's like you're in survival mode. Sure. Yeah. So you're just trying to get to the next hour mm-hmm. without breaking. At least that's how it felt for me. Yeah. Um, and so now like, you know, I had a, I had a, like a pretty easy Friday, but like, let's say I had a hard Friday, you know, my time is off at four 30. My, my work cell goes off mm-hmm. and whatever I want to do with that time after that is what I is is what I want to do at that time. Mm. I'm not being drawn back into work. If I choose to, sometimes I do that because I'm just a workaholic. Sometimes <laughs> I, I'll, I'll log back in, but that is fully my choice. It's mm. not. Right. I'm, I don't feel pressured to do that in any way. Yeah. And this is the first time I've ever really had that. I've never been able to just be off, yeah. it, or it felt like I haven't really been able to be off, and, mm. and now I am, and I can think, and I can take time for myself and and do recreational reading and do the things that that I like to do, you know, go to the gym and and go outside and Mm. I don't know, have a glass of wine without worrying that a staff member is going to call me with crisis. Mm. So uh, you're able to like not bring your work home if you want to, you can easily turn it off. But like, what about the skills that you've learned and like the skills that you use at work? Do you feel like the skills that you do at these APS uh, offices, do you, apply them into your daily life yeah if i understand correctly i think i'm gonna say yes because okay so when you're in the i feel like when you're in the helping profession you know there's a certain personality characteristic that you have and there's a certain giving trait that you have Mm. or that you embody 
And it's really hard to, because that's your being, that's, that's who you are, you know, sure. passion like that. And, and th- those are, those are intrinsic qualities. You cannot teach them to someone else. Mm. And so I feel like, you know, the way the approach that I take with clients where I'm just very patient with them, try to help them problem solve, very solution focused. I take that approach with my friends too, because that's just a part of my personality. Mm. Um, it's the reason why I got into the field. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, you don't, you never disconnect from that. Mm. But even then, sometimes you have to think about it. Like I, there, there are days and there are moments where if I had a long week of dealing with very needy clients who, who I was their only support. And so I, I had to be in that role for them. Mm. And, you know, sometimes you're modeling healthy relationships for some of these clients, mm. which can be very draining too. Mm. The last thing I want to do on the weekend is like fix problems. And so mm. if I have a, like a friend who's like, ah, oh, like, guess what happened? You know, I'm just like, Hey, I just need a moment. Like, mm. I don't want to talk about anything crazy right now. I just want to mm. watch a movie and chill. Right. Yeah. And I, and I say that I'm just like, I'm not in the mental space to help you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. I can imagine that being really draining. For me, I do some volunteer work and part of the training in the volunteer work that I do um, required us to actually learn how to listen and how to really like be non-judgmental in our way of um, thinking and processing and questioning our, our callers. I found that before I started this training, before I started volunteering, it's a crisis hotline as well. I was a certain person and I remember there was like a specific call that I got on after I finished this training um, with one of my friends who was telling me about something that was going on in her personal life. And I tried to apply those techniques. And I remember doing that consciously, trying to apply those techniques in my call with my friend. And that completely changed the dynamic between us. Like we were just like different, like now the way that we communicate as opposed to before. I noticed that it was a skill that I had learned through my volunteer work, that was actually really useful for me in my private life. So I started applying it there. But then I realized that the kinds of relationships that I was forming or um, or developing with people was also starting to tap into that kind of zone and area. So yes, I think that's a really good point that you remind yourself and you tell yourself, like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this in my private life because it can be really, really draining and exhausting at times. One of my uh, professors who was a therapist and I uh, adored her, she, she, like she said, she thought she fell into that trap, but people knew she was a therapist and she didn't like really like to uh, disclose when she would meet people, like go to a social gathering mm. to disclose that she, that she was a therapist because, oh, you're a therapist. Oh, um, what do you think of this? And it's like, no, I'm not working. So I'm not going to answer any mm. questions. And I, and I try to take that approach with Mm -hmm. my friends and people in my personal life, you know, I think the joke is, Oh, like you're going to try to analyze me like, (laughs) Hey, no, I can't because I don't have the license to do that. But B, I don't want to work right now. (laughs) I'm not working, but I do have those skills. I think naturally in my personality, that may feel like I'm analyzing someone because I'm, I'm I'm curious, you know, Mm -hmm. I have that, that nature in me, Uh, you know, you have to be curious if you're a social worker, you need to ask lots of questions. So Mm -hmm. if a, if a friend, or a loved one or anyone presents a problem to me, I'm just going to ask them lots of questions about it. Mm. And also I, you know, I want to empower them to make good choices. So, mm. you know, I'm, I'm going to use some of those techniques for them. And so it may feel like a therapy session, but that's, that's not my intention. And, mm. right. and honestly, no, like once I'm home, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, a, I'm not an investigator. I'm not a social worker. I'm, I'm me. Mm. And, and I want to be me. Uh, Shani, I wanted to ask, like, what tip would you give to someone who is interested in studying and wanting to become a therapist? What message would you really like to get to Really investigate them? and think about what you want career-wise and see if social work or therapy meets that. Mm-hmm. Um, that mm-hmm. was something I did not do. I didn't do it. I, I had this, like, preconception of, like, what life would look like because I, I, I tend to live in my head. Sure. So that's something I had to like work on myself. Mm. Um, but yeah, really see what is it that you want to do. You know, if you, if you, if, if someone, you know, they're like, they want to go into therapy because they really like research and they're like, Oh, like I want to be a teacher. I want to be a professor. You know, they, they have to understand that, that they're going to have to get their doctorate or mm. I believe their PsyD. Yeah. But they have mm-hmm. to get their doctorate. And if, are they equipped and prepared for that kind of schooling? look at the financial side of it too, you know, can you afford the program? Because Mm. a lot of times like, you know, jobs within social work, 
you know, they're not known for paying very high salaries. So mm. is it going to be worth it to pay the costs of this schooling? Um, yeah, is it, is it going to be worth it? So I think, you know, just really understanding what is it that you want to do. People who are in the helping profession have skills, but those skills are not just limited to just people in those professions. Like, you know, like you just said, you, you, you've learned how to listen. That's a big skill in the mm. helping profession, but you, you have it as well. Mm. So you can be able to take your skills and practice them without necessarily going into therapy. If you're going into therapy or going to anything, psychology or social work, really understand what it is, what's the drive, mm. you know? pushing you to that field. Mm. Mm. It was because you're a good listener. Well, there's lots of careers where you could be a good listener. Mm. And, right. You know, is it because you, you like to meet people? Well, there's lots of careers where you can meet people and you mm. could be, you know, extroverted. So mm. just really understand what is it, what it is that you want. Oh, no, definitely. I feel like a lot of people, you know, that's their number one thing. Like they feel like, oh yeah, I'm great at listening to people. Mm. People love telling me their <laughs> issues, you know? So like, you know what? I'll be a therapist, <laughs> but they don't understand how hard and like how much work you have to put in. Mm. And there's skills and there's techniques and there's lots of research. Like, um, I think I mentioned it before we started recording, like, you know, people think of therapists as this, this one blanket, mm. you know, intervention when in reality, there's many people in the field, many founders, you know, in the field who coined their own technique that has been effective mm. for certain populations or for certain struggles or whatever. Mm. So it's not just like, oh, you talk to people and you help them with their problems. It's, that's, you know, yeah, you help people with their problems, but you're also, you're really encouraging people and you're and helping them to come up with the choices. But there's a set of skills to get to that point. Mm. There's a lot of patience to get to that point as mm. well. What is your mantra? What keeps you going? What is something that you can put on a billboard for everyone to see? And it doesn't even have to be therapy related. What drives you? So, okay. So I love that you asked me this. So when I went to the county, I had to read this book. It's called the Clifton skills. Have you heard of it? No. Okay. So I would recommend reading it. It's a very short read for the county. They like, they ask you to take the personality test. What the Clifton skills basically talk about is we live in a world like, you know, Western culture. We try to develop skills that we don't really have mm -hmm. um so the, one of the examples is like michael jordan prodigy just an amazing basketball player mm -hmm. who had a certain set of skills that carried him really far in his basketball career that's mm -hmm. why he was so successful mm -hmm. right. but then he tried to play i think it was golf or baseball and he wasn't as successful mm -hmm. so it, they're saying like you need to just capitalize upon the skills that you have and develop them and, and, and build careers or make decisions based on the skills that you already have work with what's yeah. intrinsic yeah. yeah and so one of my skills that i just learned is futuristic and my boss was helping me understand it and mm -hmm. she said like this is why um, this is why you're a driven person because you always see a, a, like a goal, but you don't formulate it, but you're always, so you're always moving forward to this like very vague goal of yours mm -hmm. and you keep moving forward and you don't really have, um, what did she say? She was like, you don't, you never really put together the picture. You just see like this broad, okay, this is what I want to do. And you move towards it. That's why you're always moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what drives me, but I'm trying to dial it back a little bit and yeah. really uh, start to create short-term goals mm -hmm. so that okay. I feel fulfilled because so, because I do have that futuristic skill and I see a bigger picture and I just want to keep going forward. I don't, I'm, I'm never fulfilled because I'm, I feel like I'm not accomplishing mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. And so I'm trying to break things down so that I can actually start to like, okay, I checked this off and start to feel like, you know, get mm -hmm. those immediate rewards. But I think that's really a part of like what drives me is that I'm not a snag knit person. I've had people and they they look at me like, oh, you're doing really well. I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. So I keep trying to move forward to that wellness. Mm -hmm. And that's a good quality to have. That means I'm always moving. I'm always like, you know, chasing opportunities. It means I'm a very ambitious person. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it can burn me out as well. Mm -hmm. right. So to try to go back to like what advice I would give people 
is no, don't be content. Like always try to move forward. Um, be real, but also set realistic goals for yourself mm. so that you're not disappointing yourself. Mm. And 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 understanding that your goals, your timeline, they're gonna look, they're very unique. They're mm. unique to you. You can't compare yourself to others. That's something I did, mm. especially in this field. Like I saw the way um my 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 classmates would you know, when, when we did mock therapy sessions, I saw the way they would work with a, with their pretend client. I'm just like, Oh, like I'm inadequate, you know? Mm. And no, I'm, I'm not inadequate. I'm just, I, I possess a very unique set of skills that work for me. And mm. this is what's going to carry me, me far in my career. It really does explain like why, uh, like, you know, your whole journey so far that we've heard, like all the different things that you've done over the years, like you've, ha you've always had like more than one thing going on. It's studying, working, doing like some, you know, part-time work. Like it's just, it's, there's a lot going on there and it's, it's, it's inspirational to listen to, but I can imagine and understand why that could be really exhausting for you as well. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, I, I encourage anyone you know, understanding, you know, getting into this field. Um, remember to take care of yourself. Mm. Understand that, you know, mental health, it, it's, it, 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 there is a stigma about it. Um, and I will say for me, you know, that stigma runs deep. Even though I'm in the field, I, I, I sometimes feel weird. And I have been weird when it was my turn to go to a therapist. Mm. And so I do encourage, like, if you have that opportunity, like, I, the, that's one of the best ways to take care of yourself if you're in this mm. field have a therapist be able mm. to have some or like a colleague or some because i understand finances and all that play a part mm. but like have a colleague that you're able to who got to understand you that you're able to decompress with mm. so that you can just be effective mm. um understand that you're not inadequate that your set of skills is going to look different from others mm. uh be prepared to study be prepared to do the work but um if you have like that the you know, if you, if you have the ability to relate to others, you know, you're, you're going to go far in the field. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, we need more people working and, and we need to bring more awareness. And I just, yeah, I just encourage anyone going into the field, just, you know, do your research and, and help us out. <laughs> like, yeah. we need it. There's just so many people in need, um, you know, and a lot of people, I think we, we, we fit this culture where a lot of people are getting their, um, what they think is therapy through like uh the internet and 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 online and instagram or like a motivational meme and i'm not saying those are not effective but mm. you know there's there's a reason why there's people there's people studying this you know mm. to be therapists who you know do formal stuff with with someone so mm. just encouraging people to get into the field and yeah help us out Thank you so much for today, Shani. Thank you so it's much, Shani. It's such an honor having you here. And the conversations have been amazing. Definitely. You blessed us with your presence. <laughs> if you enjoyed the episode and would like to help support the show, please follow or subscribe. Also, we would love to hear from you. Please give us feedback by rating and reviewing on any of our different platforms listed in the description. We'd like to recognize our guests who are vulnerable and courageous enough to share their life experiences with the rest of the world. We appreciate your perspective. Thank you for showing us we are human. We would like to give a special thanks to our producer, videographer, sound engineer, and everything else in between, Joe Mills, the show would be nothing without you. I'm Joseph. And I'm Jenica. And, and we, we are, are Multispective. multispective.